Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kaziva, and welcome, dear schools. My name is Joram Bambari, as how they have mentioned it earlier. I'm taking you through uh, computer studies. That's 8040 slash one, that's paper one. My colleagues have been discussing more in paper two. We are going to try to be brief so that we are able to talk about uh, very many things in a short period of time. So starting off our today's discussion, uh, those are my names, I've already mentioned that. We start off with the topics which are in our syllabus of, uh, of all level. We have about 12 topics which we should be aware of when we prepare for our final paper. That's introduction to computers. We have computer hardware, computer software, word processing, computer presentation. We have system startup and configurations. We have computer communication and networking. We have spreadsheets, web designing, databases, elementary programming, and trends in computing. Those are the 12 topics we are, which we are supposed to read as we prepare for our final paper in computer studies. Topic number four, topic number four, number eight, nine, 10, those uh, those topics sometimes actually it is topic four, topic five, topic eight, topic nine, and topic ten. Those topics from late our paper two. They from late our paper two. But why they are included here in our discussions of paper one? It's because we can get theoretical questions from that practical work and present it to you in theory questions. So that's why we are having all these topics indicated here. Secondly, topic number 11 is highlighted elementary to computer programming. In the previous years when COVID came in, uh, NCDC tried to formulate a bridged curriculum and they were having issues with this topic saying that it might be learned at a higher time, at a later stage. But it is good also to know something from this topic as the two years which they had specified for COVID might have ended. So we need to include it still on the list which we have here. I highlighted it because earlier in the bridged curriculum work, they had commented it out. So this is uh, this is the outline of what we should know when preparing for our final paper. And what we should keep in mind is that the practical chapters, that's four, five, eight, nine, and 10 can also appear uh, theoretically. How is our, uh, our structure of the papers? Oh, our subject structure, we have actually two papers, paper one and paper two, as you're already aware. And in this brief discussion, I'll focus on paper one, and my colleague will be coming in to talk a little about paper two. Paper one structure, sometimes uh, most of us students, we don't go or take a lot of time reading the instructions. But this is generally how the instructions on our paper are. It is made up of three sections. That's section A, B, and C. And you are aware that section A is comprised of 20 compulsory multi-choice questions. Question, uh, section B is uh, comprising of six equally weighed questions carrying 60%. So it means that every question in section B is taking six is taking ten percent is taking ten marks, contributing a total of sixty percent for the whole paper. So the six questions each taking ten marks, it takes up to sixty percent. Section C is having three questions. These three questions are selected from uh, given chapters, as how we are going to see later. And on these three questions in section C. 
we always choose one question and that question carries 20 marks. So this is generally the structure of our paper. We are going to discuss section by section and see how best we can pass these sections and how we can organize for them. We start off with section A. How can we pull these 20 marks of uh, multi-choice questions? Number one, you should always read questions more than once. Try to read those questions, understand them before thinking about responding. In the questions as you're reading them, mark the simple questions. You can first do a quick read through the questions. Mark the simple questions. Identify the keywords in the questions, and then you can start answering those questions. Know the keywords in every question which they give to you to be able to respond to that question correctly. I'm going to give sample uh, sample questions and their responses. We shall see how the keywords can easily be identified. So it is a good practice to start answering the questions with those you've considered simple, those which are complex, and always reread the questions before your attempt. Then uh, to prepare for section A, section A is obtained from all the 12 chapters. So to prepare for section A for this compulsory section, you need to be having facts in all the chapters. You need to take time, sit down, you read through all your work, it's when you can be able to thoroughly pull the 20 marks out. Then we have said also that you should be able to read the question more than once. The time given is enough. You should identify the keywords in those questions. I'll identify for you some keywords in some questions such that we are able to respond correctly. Those keywords, they relate to the topics which we deal with as how I'll be discussing that at a later time. Then do not leave the mild choice questions unanswered. We don't wish to see you uh, failing to pick one of the four choices. It is really bad for you to leave a multiple choice question unanswered. Out of the four chances, you have a chance of having something right. So always uh, ensure that 20 multiple choice questions are answered. Sometimes in ICT, we may provide a box where you write uh, the answer which you think is right. So always put a letter of your choice within that alternative box if we have put the box besides the options. Do not misuse the box or draw your own. It is good to fill in the box which we have put for you and do not write more than one alternative. If you're able to read the question many times, you can always pick the answer and write there the right answer. Do not put A, then you struggle to change it to B, then you're changing it to C. Ensure that the answers are very clear. We should not start studying the paper to see whether what you've responded is section A, is, uh, is option A, option B, or option C. Always ensure that you pick an alternative, indicate it when you are sure that it is that answer which you would wish to take. Uh, this I've mentioned earlier that ensure that you provide an answer for every question in this section. It is really bad to have some choices for you there and you just leave the question blank. Ensure that you try to answer depending on the choices which are there. Then sometimes students have a tendency of thinking that uh, the option is not on the four options and the person uh, adds, says, uh, maybe on the four choices, the person puts the fifth choice and then adds what he or she thinks. That's not a good practice, always focus on the choices which they have given, those choices are always in range. So always select a right answer from those questions. 
in section B, we have said 60%. We, I have already mentioned it earlier that you should read these questions um, in details, read it many times to have the meaning out of it. I'm going to give some questions. We are going to see how this keyword in the question should be identified. You may find um, I'm asking something concerning the advantages of internet. Then for you uh, in your answering, you're phrasing the answers in another way. Or I'm asking how internet is being used in education. Your answers are just giving advantages of internet in general. So you should always focus on understanding the keywords in the question. You must respond to a question when you have understood it clearly. And in this section, in this section, it is actually having only structured numbers. We expect you to put your solution in the gaps which have been provided. So those gaps are always enough. Do not, uh, do not cross out the answers or put an arrow and say, find the continuation on the end. Avoid that. Try to phrase your answers to fit in the structured part of this question. The reason why we say you should not put arrows and tell us to find the information at the back, it's because a student's paper is marked by very many examiners. It's not one person who marks your paper. It might even be about six people, seven or eight, even 10 people can be marking a number. So when you start putting arrows and say, find the number to the end, yet the papers are coming in at a very fast rate, the chances of missing out those answers or matching them to the right number is sometimes, they are sometimes low. So always structure your, your content to fit in the structured part, which we have indicated and avoid those errors. And always use ICT language when you're, when you're dealing with ICT terms. I'll comment also on that when I'm giving the details. What you should know also is that in this section B, every question is compulsory, like how we have section A. And section B, it also requires you to read the, in, uh, the entire topics in the syllabus. We need all the 12 topics knowledge to be captured in this structured part. So you should come to this structured part when you have the knowledge in the, in the, in the whole syllabus. And I've already said that you should not forget the practical topics and all aspects relating to the practical aspects. I've already said the practical work shall appear in the theory paper. It has a percentage which we should pick from practical to, to theory when we are setting. In section C, we have said section C is having three questions where you must select only one question. Section C has three questions where you must select only one question. I will comment more still on section C on how people respond to section C. Uh, sometimes in section C, you may find a question which says, state the advantages of internet. Then we put 10 marks. And part B, we say, state the disadvantages of using internet and put 10 marks when we have not specified the total number of points. If you're getting me clearly, I'm saying in section C, we can have this number and say, state the advantages of using internet or explain the advantages of using internet and we put 10 marks. And you find students struggling to raise the 10, the 10 points because the, the number is indicating 10 marks on the side. In section C here, we expect you to give uh, a response a point, like internet can be used for research, then you explain it. So the point will take a mark and the explanation will also take a mark. So we expect a point to take two marks. So if I say, explain the advantages of using internet and I put 10 marks, 
that means I expect five, five responses which are explained. I don't expect 10 because the number is indicating 10 marks. I expect five which are explained. So the point will take a mark and then the explanation will also take a mark. On part B, if I say, uh, explain the disadvantages of using internet and I put there 10 marks, I expect the same. I expect a disadvantage and it's explanation. And the explanation doesn't mean we should write it in details like uh, we are discussing something in history. Here you can have an explanation of two lines. Two lines are basic enough to give an explanation. Two to three lines or two to three lines. It is good enough to have an explanation. So in this section, you should know that you're supposed to choose one number carrying 20 marks. And what you should keep in mind is that at least a point may carry a mark and an explanation to that point may carry a mark. Now, where do we get these three questions in the entire chapter? Where do we get the three questions in the entire chapter? We take these three questions from some topics which I'm outlining there. The three questions are picked from computer hardware, data communication and networking, system startup and configuration, then trends in computing and elementary programming. In those five chapters, we shall see a way of picking the three questions. They may not cut across they may not cut across many topics. If we are picking a question from hardware, it may come entirely from hardware. If we are picking a question from data communication and networking, then this question is picked, uh, may be picked entirely from data communication and networking. So out of these five chapters, we shall have three questions where you have to pick one question. Again, elementary programming, I've put a line on it because uh, as uh, because of the reason I mentioned earlier, but you need to have still knowledge in, in the topic. You have to uh, have knowledge in the topic. So out of those five topics, you'll see three numbers which come out of those topics and you have to choose one. Now, uh, in section B, I've been mentioning about keywords, keywords, keywords. How do we get these keywords? And how can we respond also keeping keywords in mind? That takes me briefly to some general question approach tips. Always start with leading keywords when defining or explaining computer terms always start with the leading keywords. I'll give an example here of a question. If I say, define a router, define a router. The keyword here is define. I'm giving a definition. I'm giving a definition. I'm giving a definition of a router, define a router. Now, also in my definition, I should know the major keyword which apply to, uh, to a router. A router is a networking device. A router is a networking device. So in my definition, in my explanation, I should have the word networking device. If I say, explain the term switch as used in computing, explain the term switch. A switch is also a networking device. A switch is a networking device. If I say, explain the term hub, a hub is also a networking device. So these keywords should be brought out in your explanations. And tip number one is saying, bring them very close at the start, such that we know that you're talking about something which you already know. Some students, instead of putting um, this keyword, some students, you find them neglecting the keyword and putting here the word one. You say define a route. A person says, this is one designed to receive, analyze and move incoming packets. That one will be crossed. We expect you to use the keywords. 
a router, a modem, a switch, a repeater, a hub. All those are networking devices. So the keyword there is a networking device. Uh, example number two, if I say, what is data backup? Data backup. The keyword here is a copy, a copy of something. It is a copy of a computer file. You can follow the definition, but here in point in tip number one, we are saying those keywords should come out and avoid replacing these keywords with the term one. So it says this is one, one that does this. Where there is that one, the word one, you are trying to neglect the key word. So always ensure that those keywords are clearly indicated. Uh, if I say explain the term word wrap, word wrap as used in, in word processing, word wrap is a feature. The keyword is that it is a feature in Microsoft, uh, in, in a word processor, not specifically Microsoft Word. It is a feature in a word processor. Any word processor should have uh, my, uh, word wrap, which is a feature. So you should know the keywords of explaining specific terms. Avoid saying this is one that one that does the other. This is one that does this. That shows you do not know the computer terms. You do not know the keywords. You don't have the computer terms to use. So that answer is wrong. If I say define a computer virus, it is a program. A computer virus is a program. That's the starting point. It is a program. It is a computer program. So you can explain now the answer, but when you have the keyword indicated. Tip number one, always bring the keywords very close in the structured part and all, also in section C, where you have to explain or give an essay of what has been indicated. Then as footnote, a footnote is a reference in a word document. What does it do? That one you can read about it. But tip number one is telling us, always bring those words very clear. Number two, avoid the redundancy in your answers. Ensure that you give the answers uh, which are direct and you're straight to the point. The gaps which we give in section B in the structured part should be enough for your points. If you start having issues with the spaces provided, then know that your answers are having a lot of redundancy. Sometimes we tend to give answers having a lot of words which we do not need in those answers. For example, if I say define a computer virus, there, are two, the, there is a definition there. There is a definition there and another one down. The first person defines a computer virus as a type of computer program that when executed, replicates itself by modifying other computer programs and inserting its own code. That's the first definition. Now, according to tip number two, there are some redundant words here. If I leave out type of computer and I say this is a program, I leave out when executed, I leave out the other word coming again, computer program, and I cross out inserting its own code. And I just say, this is a program that replicates itself by modifying other programs. Or if I say, this is a program that disorganizes the functionality, sorry, that disorganizes the functionality of a computer, do I still remain right? So there are some words, this tip shows us, there are some words sometimes which we may not need in a definition and we keep bringing them. And in the very end, we say the space provided is not enough. The space is always enough. We should always bring keywords very close, like how I've highlighted that program, program. Then also we should always avoid unnecessary words in our definitions. So it is the same 
The other person said a computer virus is a small or simple program designed to disrupt the normal functionality of a computer. And another one just said, a computer virus is a program that disrupts the computer operations. The second person is also right because uh, a virus is a program that disrupts the computer operation. There is a way we expect the computer to operate. So if, a, if there is that program which disorganizes the normal functionality, then we call it a virus. So avoid words which may not be uh, necessary, like defining a virus as a simple or a small program. Viruses which are programs to sit down and write codes enough codes actually to disorganize the full functionality of a computer. Then another thing which I would wish to comment about is uh, giving some word, uh, one word answers. Sometimes we just mention a word when we are expected to give a full definition or when we are expected to give an explanation. Some situations or some questions which require you to give an explanation, avoid just putting there one word. For example, if we say give ways how IT is used to improve education in your school, how can IT be used to improve education in your school? Then you say for research. The way is not coming out clearly how it is being used. Here, the word is how, how something is used to improve education. So we are looking for how IT will be used to improve education. So it is about how. When you say for research, that is not complete. I would rather phrase that as, as this. IT can be used by students to carry out research using internet. IT can be used by students to carry out research using the internet. So we should avoid putting just one word as an answer when the question requires us to give clarification on what we are supposed to put there. So we need to give uh, an explanation of what we expect. This other person said, how can IT be used to improve education say, using projectors? So we should make the use of projectors clear and we show how it is being used. Maybe teachers are using projectors to project uh, classwork. You need to give that explanation and ensure that it comes out clearly. Uh, the other one is uh, you should always relate your answers to the question ensure that uh, the answers you're giving are related to the question. That comes back to reading the question very many times. You need to read it such that you understand, uh, you understand it clearly. You need to read the question many times, understand it clearly such that your answers are in coordination with the question. Some people give answers which are totally not linking to the question. I have an example. I say stage two challenges of using IT at home. Two challenges of using IT at home. Someone says uh, it is expensive. The other person says power fluctuation or load shedding. We need to phrase these points in a way that they will make sense relating to this to the question. We need two challenges of using IT at home. Power fluctuation. This is not coming out as a challenge or power shading or load shading. It is not coming out as um, a challenge. The challenge of using IT at home, maybe if you want to mention something about load shading, you need to bring it out that load shading maybe may burn IT equipment. You have to be clear and assure that your answer, when read, the person can understand and make meaning in relation to the question. So if I was to somehow phrase uh, power fluctuation or load shedding, I can say IT equipment can easily be damaged by electric fluctuations or by load shedding. I'd be clear to show that actually 
uh, load shedding may spoil the IT equipment and that's the challenge. I have to explain that clearly. The other one I'll be, uh, okay, the other point is, or oh, the other tip is questions that require distinguishing or differentiating some given terms. You should ensure that these terms are both defined or uh, explained clearly so that we get a clear meaning. For example, if I say distinguish between hard copy and soft copy as used in computing, when you're dif distinguishing or differentiating these terms, you may have to avoid answers like hard copy is tangible printed computer file on paper, while soft copy is not tangible. You need, you need to be clear on what soft copy is, in that if a person covers one section, the other one is making meaning. Hard copy, it is true, hard copy is tangible printed computer file on paper, okay, this, is, this part is okay, but this other part of while is not okay. So if your differentiated terms, both sides should be making this in that if a person removes one side, then the other one makes sense. If I cover the part of hard copy and I read from soft copy here, if I pass this part of soft copy to someone who has never been in our ICT class, I say soft copy is not tangible, it will not make sense to that person. But the first part of hard copy, if I pass it to a non computer student, the person can understand it. So for differentiating or distinguishing, we require that both sides should be right. Otherwise, you may get a zero on such if both sides are not right. How should I make soft copy clear? You can read the definition of soft copy. But the idea here is, if you're explaining what hard copy is, then soft copy should also be clear. Uh, before going to the next tip, I can give another example. If I say, differentiate the RAM from ROM, differentiate RAM from ROM, differentiate RAM from ROM. Ro, if you say RAM is volatile, while ROM is not, we are supposed to cross that. Because if I cover the part for RAM, you remain with ROM is not. ROM is not what? So you have to be clear and say RAM is volatile, while Rome is non-volatile. So both sides should make sense. That's what I'm trying to bring out here. And then um, there are some questions which are comparative in nature. These questions require the answers to also be comparative. They are comparative questions. They require comparative answers. For example, uh, if I have the question given there, state two advantages of soft copies over hard copies, and you say soft copies can be made into many copies. This is right about soft copy. Soft copies can be made into many copies. But even hard copy, at school we distribute uh, to you exams which have been printed. So we have made many copies out of soft of out of hard copy. Uh, the second person said soft copies can be shared among many people. Yes, they can be shared among many people, but even hardware can be shared among very many people. This kind of question being comparative, it is comparing the advantages of soft copy over hard copy, we need to put a comparative aspect. These two points would be right if we never had a comparative aspect of, of, of a hard copy here. If we had state two advantages of soft copy, you can leave them like that. But if we say state two advantages of soft copy over hard copy, you need to put a comparative aspect. In this case, I can add the word easily. If I add the word easily here, I say soft copies can easily be made into many copies, then uh, it brings out 
the comparison, the easiness which comes with having soft copy in too many copies is, is significant compared to uh, compared to compared to hard copies. So members, uh, that's what I can present to you about paper one. We can allow my colleague for paper two to come in, then we shall respond to the questions at the very end. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Teacher Joram. Uh, Mr. Simon? Hello. Oh. Can you hear me, Mr. Kaziba? Yes, you are clear. Good. I wish to welcome everyone and call. Thank you, Mr. Wambale, for the wonderful sharing you've given us. Uh, dear colleagues, schools, and the colleagues in the profession that are on the call, I welcome you all once again. Thank you for joining this call. Allow me without wasting much time to join and uh, continue from where my colleague has ended. I want to think that my screen can be shared can be seen clearly. So we are talking about uh, computer studies for paper one and two. And my name is Kanike Simon Peter Chiviri. I work in schools, St. Edward Zibukumi and St. Karen Bases in Villa Maria. I'm glad to be part of this noble cause of taking, taking you through this. As seen with Mr. Joram, uh, our paper has two papers. That is paper one for theory and paper two for practical. As Mr. Bambale said, we get the final mark by adding paper one, what you get from paper one and what you get from paper two because both papers are marked out of 100 just a matter of getting the average and we get for you your final mark. Now I talk about paper two. Paper two has two sections also, section A and B. Section A has one question with parts A and B, part A being a word processor question and part B is for spreadsheets. Each of these two questions carries 20 marks, which gives us a total of 40 marks for section A. Then section B has three questions from three applications. It has a question from the presentation, which you commonly call PowerPoint, though it is Microsoft PowerPoint. We have a question from database, which we commonly study Microsoft Access, and another question from website designing. Website designing is always done using a number of applications, regardless of the application that you use as a candidate. For us as teachers, as examiners, every examiner will need just a website. We'll not ask you for which one you used. Then from there, you'll be required to attempt any two of those three. But as Mr. Bambale said, you need of these three applications, you need knowledge of all of them because questions are going to come from paper one as in paper one, but arising from all those three applications. Why do students fail, especially paper two? The very first factor is cyberphobia. That is a fear of computers. You find a candidate is in senior four, and up to now, you can still shiver on the keyboard. You can still type using only these two fingers here. My friend, that is what we call cyberphobia. And that one leads to a slow speed as you're typing 
you will not complete the content that is required of you to complete. Then using wrong applications, we asked you to design something in a, they draw for you a table for part A, which is Word, and you look at that table as a spreadsheet application. Then for you, you go and open Microsoft Excel because you see tables already designed and drawn for you in Excel. You will not get marks there. Then failing to interpret questions. We are going to sample some questions there and we shall see what do you mean by failing to interpret questions? Some learners would love to beautify the work and you leave out the exam requirements. Please don't beautify the work. Do what the question asks you to do. Failure to ban work on CDs or banning shortcuts on CDs. This is a very common mistake that learners do, actually with some of us, the teachers, that we may hand in or submit an empty CD, which cannot be opened by whoever is going to mark it. Then other candidates may fail to print their work and then you submit an empty CD. The, one of the advantages of the printouts, those hard copies, is to make sure that just in case your CD got issues along the way of submitting, the examiner can always look at your hard copy. And you never know a question that would call for 20 marks, you would get maybe some 15 or 16, even if it is 10 you can walk away with something. Then, which advice can we give? Please practice. All candidates, please get time, get sit on the computers and practice. By practicing, you'll avoid the cyberphobia. You'll get used to the computer. All candidates are used to particular computers and keyboards. You'll embarrass yourself if you use a laptop for the exam when you're not used to the laptop. I want to encourage you and ask your teacher in the lab, please tell the teacher that, no, I am not used to this computer. I need to use the other one, such that you don't get any excuse with you because you always know that a bad workman will always blame his tools. You will tell us that I failed this because I used a computer which I'm not used to. Even when you know the instructions prior to the exam, Please read the exam, read the instructions before starting to do the exam. You have four applications to attempt. Time yourself to spend not more than 30 minutes on every application because you have two hours and 15 minutes. That time is inclusive of the time for you to do the work and also the time for printing your work. Start with the questions from section B because they carry more marks. This is just an advice. We saw that in section B, the three applications, each of them carries 30 marks. That is a total of 60. Section A, which is word and the spreadsheet carries 40 marks. And the commonly students take a lot of time on word. Students take an hour on word processing and ignore the presentation and database and website where they would score around the 30 out of 30, if not even 28, 29, 25. So I would advise start with questions from section B, do them, then cross over and go to section A, fight for the 20, which is 40. Take some minutes, read each question from the whole question paper. Start with a question you have more marks. Read through, I'm going to demonstrate this one, I think, as in one of the question papers that I prepared. Ensure that you don't save shortcuts in your folder, because when you save the shortcuts in the folder, finally, it will go to the CD, because you'll save that folder on your CD. Take note of the technical terms of the application names and the skills that the examiner is asking for. For example, we tell you a word processor. Will you go and open Microsoft Excel? We told you to open a spreadsheet. Will you go to open Microsoft Access? We told you to open a spreadsheet. Will you go and open Microsoft Publisher? Please be very confident and be sure of the technical terms that you use in these applications. Before you print, make sure that your work 
fits on all the sheets, on all the papers. This is so common in Word and uh, Excel. Sometimes you find that you print and only one uh, column flows onto the next, the next page. You print a graph and the graph is on two pages. Then try to understand the requirements of the question. You only impress the examiner by showing that you know and you can do what the examiner actually asked for. Each question asked for in an, asked in an application targets a particular skill. Don't show an examiner that you know what is not asked for. This is so common. Uh, students have a tendency and a myth actually which you would call a fallacy that it is common in presentation that PowerPoint, the examiner will mark you based on how you will please him. These exams are not marked by the way you please the examiner because we all know that judgment is objective. What, I see, what you see as beautiful to you, you will not be beautiful to me. What you see as good will not be good to me. So make sure that you do only the skill that is asked for by that particular examiner. Allow me that in this time, I go through to demonstrate a few things there. I prepared a simple question paper here. We see it runs for two hours and 15 minutes. You are told that please section A and B, we said read the instructions, but allow me go direct here. An example is word processing here, which I think all the candidates all over Uganda will be interested in doing as first question. I told you in the first place that this question calls for 20 marks, Spreadsheet here will call for 20 marks. This database here calls for 30 marks. You come to, uh, this should be presentation calls for 30 marks. Then website also calls for 30 marks. Why would you really go in and start with a question of 20 marks when there is a question of 30 marks? How I wish we start with the other one because after all, even if you attempt only two questions in section B, you are not going to be penalized for not attempting any question in section A. But if you do all the three questions in section B, still the examiners will mark only two out of them. Now, look at this word processing up question here. You are told to type the following text as it appears. I want to highlight this coward here, as it appears. Whoever said this question must have done some things in that question there. Please make sure that you do your best to do whatever the question is asking for. Look at the question paper there. Are there some formatting features that you can identify? Please look for them and make sure that as you type that those three paragraphs, for example, you track and put the formatting features the way they were put. Because you never know somewhere on the score grid, the examiner will have to look out for those formatting features. For example, remember we talked about that be familiar with the technical terms. If you don't know that this is a drop cap, you will not do it. We have seen some candidates here. I demonstrated this. Some candidates are very wise enough. They'll get this letter W, for example, and they will increase the font size. And later they will tell you that I have put a drop cap. Do you think this one appears the same as this? It is not. So the examiner is also very wise. He will not give you a mark for that. You have tried to increase the font size, but you have not put what was asked for. Look at this. The examiner has the right of changing and awarding these five marks, because I believe there is also one for saving your work 
as your name and personal number. Personal number, dear candidates, is not your telephone number. Many candidates will put for us here what they call personal number and they put their personal telephone numbers. Please put a personal number as it was given to you by your those, by your deputy, by whoever is in charge of your academics at school. Um, come here, draw a 4.5 line below the title apply a suitable title. Now here, the examiner may be asking, looking for a skill. Are you able, this text as it was given to you, commonly when we open a new Word document here, it is a common one that students don't want to attend to. When we open a new document here, it will give us something here whereby when you start typing water, you're beginning from the top. So the examiner is looking for a skill. Are you able to push this text down such that as you push it down, you can go back up and put a title, maybe water in our community. So that one becomes a title. And how should the title look like anyway? Let me go to this other part. You told that after putting uh, the title, please underline. Don't underline, but draw a 4.5 line below the title with any color, unlike blue or black. You see the number of conditions there with the two marks. Now, don't do what you know, but do what the examiner wants you to do. Sometimes we don't know what to do. And me as a student, I have typed this as my title. I don't know where the, where the shapes, where the lines are. I'll come here and underline the word. Is that a line? It's not a line, you're just underlining. But after coming here in the shapes, for example, you look for a line of your choice. The examiner said, put it, like that, it should not be blue. So come and look for the shape outline color. Give it red. Look for what he called the shape, what he called the size, shape outline. He said it should be 4.5, the weight. Look for 4.5. Now, however good a candidate you may be, if those are the things that the examiner wants, don't come again and say, no, he wanted many things. Let me come here and also change the dashes. I will give him those dashes because they look good for me. I will come here and make sure that I put for him also these arrows here. So you beautify the line. Remember, you're taking time. Those dots and broken line that you're doing are not asked for. So don't waste time there in doing what the examiner did not ask from you. Highlight the first paragraph with a light color. This, is, this was so interesting here. Issues of colors is quite pertinent and important. This is a color changed. This is a color also changed. This is a color also changed. Now the examiner said, put this highlight color in the first paragraph. This candidate did change the color, right? But this is not the color that the examiner wanted. This is a font color. When you look at the top here in the home tab in the font, this one is a highlight color. When you look at it, it is text highlight color. We have a font color and what we call the shading or field color. So realize that the color that the examiner wanted on paragraph one, the, the candidate applied this on paragraph two, sorry, in paragraph three. So to avoid issues, because you never know here, the examiner, if it was really one mark, let us see how many marks will have been. Highlight the first paragraph with the light color. This is one mark. That mark is Potea. 
you will not get this mark here because you're not put you're changing your color, which is not a highlight color. That's one. And you're putting the highlight color true, but on a wrong paragraph, on a wrong destination. So make sure that follow the instructions, read them and understand them very, very fast and clearly. I talk about another two point border on the last paragraph. These are some of the confusing things. On the last paragraph, this is the last paragraph. When we come to put borders, for example, borders are a bit confusing. There is a page board. The examiner says, put a paragraph border. If you're very familiar with what the, the, the guy is asking, put a two point border on the last paragraph. Some of these things may not clearly be identified and told to you that please put a paragraph border, but he's being specific here that on only the last paragraph. Now we are going to come and find some friends of ours who will come here, borders, look for maybe a box and they say the two point, which I think is, I'm not seeing it here, two points then. We'll just click there. This is a border. This is a page border. But the examiner wanted to have this one. The paragraph border, which you find in the borders. You select the page, select the line style, the line size. Unfortunately, the two point is not up here in there so what does he want apply this to that paragraph and then okay so because this paragraph is already given columns that is how the paragraph is going to appear but besides there is also another kind of border which commonly confuses students here when we come to borders, select this. When you say apply to, there is also a text border. For example, if another candidate will put this, but on another, on the very paragraph, but a wrong border. It is true you're putting a border, but that is not the border that was asked for. So please make sure that you pay attention. We have some good candidates who are intelligent and they actually know how the work would look like. Take an example. Change the first paragraph to three columns. I want to talk about the issue of wasting time. This paragraph is already changed to three columns. This candidate went further and put a line here but this line was not asked for. Sometimes there is a question that comes and asks you to put columns with a line between. If it was the same question, I just thought of it there. This candidate is right. He has put a line here and another line. Another line will come here. So the candidate is having a line between the columns. Allow me to first remove the borders here for us to clearly see what we want to see. The candidate has put a line between there. Let me sample you with this one also to have a column with a line between, three columns. Three columns with a line between The three columns are having lines between. But this first candidate, chances are high that you're going to be marked wrong because this is just a shape. This one is just a shape which I can remove anytime. But this one can easily be proven that there is a line that was put along the columns here. So we shall come and test and confirm from here. So don't be very good wiseacking candidates. 
those who put things according because you know how it looks like, then for you, you put it there when it is either not called for or it is not the accurate one. But however, I will encourage you, if for example, this one of a line between, you are not sure of how to put that line, but you know there should be a line there. Please use any mechanism like this candidate did and put that line there. You never know the examiner may have mercy on you and say that you're such a bright, intelligent candidate, where the chances are very low of calling you such a bright and intelligent candidate. We are dwelling so much on the uh, word. The other issue is, the greatest issue is printing. I told you that please make sure that you hand in your work. Before you print, can you preview your work? Come control P and select a preview here. Good enough that most of the new versions of Office, the moment you come to print, they will always give you a preview. So this is how my work is going to look like. If it looks fine there, you are free to continue to do the printing, okay? Now, allow me as time is running faster, let me talk about the next application here. Um, I'll talk about this next application. We are asked to create a spreadsheet application, enter the data, save it as your name and personal number in your folder. If you're very attentive to the questions that are given to you, all of them are telling you to save your name, personal number in your folder. This is always done to make sure that you don't meander around to lose your data, to lose your information, to lose your work. Quite a number of times as candidates come, they will open, for example, spreadsheet. As they open spreadsheet, it is this one. After opening this one, the moment I come to file and select save, they will simply browse and put their name. Maybe this candidate, I will use Namia Alice 575A, no, 075, and click save. This candidate has not determined where her work is going. So it would be very good and better of you to make sure that as you're saving, you determine where your work is saved. Commonly, what candidates do, they know, I think we talk about this one also, they know very well that I will be doing Word, Excel, PowerPoint. So create a folder here. The folder is called Namia Alice with your personal number 07. And you end. Commonly what they do, some, not all. They open that folder and right here, you know that I am going to create, I am going to do a spreadsheet. So you come here after reading through the whole question paper, you know that I'm going to do a spreadsheet. It is asking me to save it as Namiaro Alice 575. Sorry, 075. You know that I am going to do another application in Word. Where is my word processor here? I'm going to create an application here. You right click and open a word document, also called Namiaro Alice 075. I know I am going to do PowerPoint. Come here, come to new, create. 
a presentation. You're going to find that all the four applications I'm going to attempt, this is the Namialo Alice 075. Unfortunately, website has no specific application. So let me put database here, new Microsoft Access database. I call it also Namialo Alice 075. So this is how your folder should look like. After doing your work, you just have to come here, get this entire folder and send it to your, send it to your CD. Now, let me talk about this spreadsheet here. I want to demonstrate something in the spreadsheet. I have this one this spreadsheet file. Yes. This is the work that we have. Unfortunately, these ones are not there. This is the work that the examiner gave us to do. He said, enter the data as it is and save it as your name. So we saved it there. Given that the students' marks are out of are in percentages, turn them. Now, what do we expect you to know here? We are not going to calculate very many things because we are supposed to get a six and time is running. I know many of you are going for supper in various schools right now, but let's summarize this. What do we expect of you? Know the difference between a function and a formula in a spreadsheet be in a position of determining what a, what a formula is. Now here, you asked to insert a new column. Where does the new column go? We need a column somewhere here, insert. We need one here, and we are told to put another one here. Now this one should be a formula. We are told that the marks are in percentages. Compute them out of 40 for paper one and out of 60 for paper two. So you're expected to come here and know which formula should it be. This is out of 100. So this is 80 out of 100. So we are supposed to convert it to 40 times 40. That is a formula. But there are some crafty candidates who are very good. So this one, we shall, we have some good candidates. We will come on the computer here. I have a calculator here. Please calculator come very fast. Calculator has come. This learner is very good alone in mathematics. Eh? Uh, he knows that paper two is out of 60. So we'll get the 88 divided by 60, get the answer times 40, times 60. No, 88 divided by 100 times 60. He will get that answer. He will come here and put 52.8. He will go on calculating for all these ones. But just know that as a spreadsheet is being, that is what we talked about being technical. As we mark spreadsheet, please, examiner will come and check this and check in the formula bar here. Did you put the correct formula? If you put a correct formula, you'll get your mark. This friend of ours didn't put a correct formula. Now, as you wind up, when you're going to print a spreadsheet, please make sure that you print both interfaces. Look at your keyboard there. There is a control button with another button called a tilde. A tilde, there is a button there below the escape key. If you're close to a keyboard, please have a look at it. When you press control and that tilde there, 
it is going to display for you the formulas that you have put in your entire sheet. So it would be very good that when you're going to print your work, please also print out this interface. Make sure that your work is tidy. We talked about this. Print, now come and resize this because ideally when we come to print this, this one is giving us three pages when you look down here. These are three pages. We have some dotted lines somewhere here. If you very, if you can clearly see this, this dotted line is showing us where the page is going to end. Same as this. So please make sure that you either turn your page to, to landscape, whether asked for or not, to make sure that your work fits. Come, resize your sheets, resize the, the thing, but still, if everything goes to the worst and you see that things are not working out, come to file. When we come to print, there is somewhere in the scaling here and there is no scaling. You will click there and tell the spreadsheet that please fit all columns to one page. It will condense everything there that you have selected and it will give you one page to avoid your work from breaking out. But however, when you see that the, the, the formulas are coming too tiny, please let it be normal. Don't fit them when the things are not being normal. Uh, we have still other applications, but time is running very fast. Allow me that for now, we may have to end here. I see it's just time. Dear Mr. Kaziva, allow me that I want to end here for now. Unless there are questions to, uh, to, to beat time, I don't know what we can do. But for now, allow me to end there because I saw we are supposed to end at six. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Simon and Mr. Jura. Uh, maybe we can first attempt to some questions. Uh, those members that have questions, uh, kindly raise up your hands uh, because our facilitators are still on and then they respond to your questions. In case you have any question, it can be in theory, it can be in practical, uh, raise up your hand or you can put it in the chat and then we get the response. Madiba, you have see Hezron here. Okay. Hezron as if he's just clapping. Hezron, we have Madiba. Oh. Okay. Yes, good evening, members. Thank you for the work. This is John K. They have used in our phone. My emphasis should be on uh, paper one or level. Learners don't know how to select the numbers more or so with section C. Section C, we always have topics. Topics we have uh, programming, hardware, networking, and uh, uh, and uh, software too. So a learner is supposed to pick uh, one question, and this question is supposed to be 10 marks, positive 10 marks, negative. So as you are, as they are learners are answering, we always consider too much of uh, the references and the comparison words. Here we have whereas or compared to if the question is called in more so with the section, e, uh, section C, part B of the question. Here we are calling the two sides of the question. Then number one of section e, C is always inquiring for knowledge. So you have to define something about what has been asked in section C. Then when it comes to section B and section A, we say that the whole, the whole syllabus is going to be set. So this means that as learners are filling up answers from section A, there might be answers that may suit to section B. So as they are revising, or as we are revising as learners, we need to so much be equipped with the whole syllabus because questions are going to come from generation, hardware, software, characteristics, up to the part of system security. Not forgetting that uh, any topic on the five practical numbers, there might be questions of definition, 
differences and uh, short forms. I thank you. Thank you thank so you, much. John K. For the submission. Okay, uh, then. There is a question from Koboni, uh, Mr. Simon, hope you have seen that question. Yes, I have answered in the chat. Okay. But I said that that button you press, someone is asking to repeat the procedure for showing the formula and the function to switch between the formula, I think, and the front end. Press the control button and the tilde. The tilde is that button below the escape. It has that uh, approximate symbol. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. I don't know whether we have another question uh, from any of the schools that are present. Uh, Zewu, okay, Mary Asumta, okay, ICT class Kaputo. Okay, I think uh, everything has been very okay. Okay, let me ask Mr. Simon to give his concluding remarks and then Mr. Juram also you give as we wait for the principal from the ministry. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kaziva. In the first place, I want to thank you for, for organizing this. It has run for close to two weeks. As I give this, I'm seeing some hands here. Maybe I can allow them to come in. Okay, it is fine. Uh, Rogers. Rogers, please unmute. Rogers, are you there? I think Rogers is unable to unmute. I want to thank all the students but, and uh, encourage dear candidates, please don't lose hope. I know we are in mocks and the mocks are actually mocking you. They are trying you and testing you and checking you, but the target is your name. So don't lose hope here. We still have time and the zeal, please. A dying horse kicks hardest. Please stay kicking till the end of the hour, till the ninth hour. I want to thank all the teachers who are on call. Please thank you very much for joining us and for always being there for our learners and our candidates. I want to thank you again, Mr. Kaziva and my colleague, Joram. Thank you for being part of this noble cause of helping the nation. I submit, I remain Simon Peter Kanike Chiviri, uh, an ICT teacher. Okay, uh, thank you so much, teacher Simon. Okay, let's hear from Mr. Joram. Thank you so much, Mr. Kaziva. I thank everyone who has organized uh, all these sessions for the two weeks. I thank the students for taking time to listen in to teachers from various areas. I thank the ICT teachers and all other uh, school heads who have enabled students to have these sessions for the past two weeks. I thank you so much for everything which you've put in and reserving all your time. I thank Mr. Dungu, Mr. Steven for the organization. And also, I thank students for taking time also to come and join us. And I encourage students to always read hard and come into such programs when they are available to listen in to different teachers from different areas. Thanks for impressing technology. Have a good evening. Thank you so much. Uh, Rogers, Rogers, you have a burning question. If you can just ask. Rogers? 
Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, my question was like in section C, you were telling me that you stop putting their short answers like for research. Then I say, I ask like, what if I put for research and then I give an explanation? Okay, teacher Joram is going to respond. Oh, thanks so much. Uh, the logic on section C is to give a point and then you explain it, uh, not aiming at the marks which they may have put. I gave an example stating the advantages of using internet and having there 10 marks. So if you put for research, that will be a mark and its explanation will also be a mark. What I meant was that you should not leave the points hanging and those points not having meaning. If you focus them to the questions, they may end up losing meaning. So in section C, it is okay to give a very brief answer as how you've put it for research, but then followed by an explanation such that there is the mark for the point and then the mark for the explanation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I want also to add my voice uh, to Mr. Joram and also to Mr. Simon, thank all the schools and the heads uh, who have been able to connect their students uh, from the time we started these sessions. We are really very grateful. But I also want to thank our facilitators, Mr. Joram and Mr. Simon, uh, for the great work you have done in these two weeks. We are really very grateful and thank you so, so much. Allow me now to welcome uh, Mr. Ronald uh, to have uh, a closing remark uh, for this session. Mr. Ronald, you are most welcome. Um, thank you, Mr. Kaziba. I hope you can hear me well. Yes, you are very clear. Okay. Um, I want to thank all those who have made this possible. I want to thank the teachers who have been teaching us. I want to thank you, Mr. Kaziva, and your team at Holistic e Learning Platform. I want to thank Renew that has supported some of the schools with internet connectivity. I want to thank UICT that trained teachers um, all the way from COVID. We have seen some of those teachers coming up now to actually um, deliver online courses. This was a pilot program that has run for two weeks. And our question was, can the schools connect to each other? Are the school head teachers willing to bring the students on board? Are the teachers willing to bring the students on board? That was one question. And I think we have answered it positively that the schools are willing and the head teachers are willing. The second question was, can we reach the schools using technology? And I think the schools that have come online have demonstrated that we can actually reach the schools using technology. And as a Minister of Education, what we need to do now is to make sure that there is internet connectivity, there are ICT equipment in the different schools. The third question was, can we find teachers who are willing to share knowledge freely and using all they have to make sure that other learners without uh, being in their schools can learn um, with them? And I think now we have answered that positively, that there are men and women out there who are teachers and they are willing to support learning in this country. And if one asked me, do we have national teachers? I think um, Simon, um, Mr. Bwambale here today have demonstrated that they are national teachers. Of course, on the other side, I've been watching a mathematics A-level lesson conducted by a head teacher of St. Joseph's College, Laibi in Gulu. And that head teacher is one of those national teachers. So I think we have everything in place to close the learning gap. We just need to tighten the rope. 
bring in better internet connectivity to the schools, bring in better uh, equipment, and also train the teachers and create a cohort of uh, national teachers that can support learning. The teachers who have been on ground to follow up with what their senior teachers or facilitators have said, you are our heroes and we want to thank you very much. And definitely after MOOCs, we are coming back to the same program to ensure that the candidates 2023 excel and we are here as, uh, as teachers to support you candidates to continue working hard and make sure that you excel. So I want to thank all the learners that have uh, given us their time. You have listened in, you have been at it. You don't have sports, you don't have, you go late for uh, dinner or supper and it's all to make sure that you perform better. So go out there in your mock exams who are right, who, are, who have started writing exams and write the great answers that we want to see. But we shall continue after uh, you return from home. We shall continue to make sure that we close the learning gap and bring more schools online. So as Ministry of Education and Sports, on behalf of the minister, on behalf of the permanent secretary, on behalf of all the commissioners, we would like to thank whoever has been behind this uh, program and wish that you continue when the schools will open. We want to thank the students for the time you've given to this, and we pray that you perform well in your, in your mock examinations. With that, I want to say, uh, success to everyone in your mock exams and declare this pilot session closed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wambale. You can end the meeting. <laughs>